In this video, you'll learn basic GED science skills to help you pass GED science faster, and we're gonna help you build a foundation to make harder GED science questions easier to understand in the future. So it's really important to understand the scientific method. So let me read the steps to you, and if the steps don't make full sense, don't worry, because we're gonna look at an example that I think will clear this up for you. And the first step is to observe a phenomenon and form a question about it. The second step is to collect data. And once you've collected data, the third step is to form a hypothesis. Now, if you're not sure what the word hypothesis means, then don't worry. It's just a fancy way of saying an educated guess. Now, the fourth step is to test that hypothesis by doing an experiment. And the last step is to reach a conclusion. So basically you look at the result of the experiment and you ask yourself, does this support the hypothesis that I made or not? So let me make an example here to hopefully clear this up. So let's imagine for a second that I'm watching TV and, or let's say I sit down to watch TV and I take my remote and I hit the power button on the remote and nothing happens. So I might, form a question I might ask why won't my TV why won't my TV turn on when I press the power button on the remote so I decide to collect data so I get up I walk over to my TV and I see that it's plugged into the wall and I even push the button that's on the TV and I see that when I push the TV button it turns the TV on all right so my hypothesis then or my educated guess about what's going on is that the batteries and the remote are dead. So I want to test this hypothesis through an experiment. And it's a pretty easy experiment to do. I just take the batteries out and I'm going to put new batteries in. So that's my little experiment. And lastly, I want to ask, does the experimental results support my hypothesis? Well, let's say that when I did that experiment, I put new batteries into the remote and I try again. And now the remote's turning the TV on. So my conclusion is yes, absolutely. The, uh, the hypothesis that the batteries and the remote are dead is supported by the experiment. Now, what would happen if I tried the remote again after I put the new batteries in and it did not turn the TV on? Well, the next step would be to form a new hypothesis. Maybe I could maybe wonder if the remote is just broken. Maybe that could be it. Um, who knows? But example here that I created... Uh, the result supports the hypothesis. So this is just kind of a fun example here, hopefully, but this uh, hopefully makes you makes it more clear what the five steps of the scientific method are. And I want to talk about something that's related here in terms of experiments, which is the concept of independent and dependent variables. And this can be a little bit tricky to understand, but basically what you need to know is that the dependent variable is the phenomenon that you're studying, and an easy way to remember it is to remember that the dependent variable depends on another variable. Now, the independent variable does not depend on another variable, and it's something that you think might be affecting that phenomenon. So I know that you might be, you've heard the definitions, but it just, it it's kind of might sound like gibberish right now, just a bunch of big words. So let's use another example here to hopefully make this more clear. So, okay, so let's say, suppose my remote isn't turning the TV on, just like I said, right? And I suspect that the batteries are dead. So I remove those old batteries and I replace them with new ones and now the TV is turning on. In that experiment, what would you say is the dependent variable and what would you say is the independent variable? So what I'd like you to do now, if you if you want to, is to pause the video, look at the two bullet points that tell you what the dependent and independent variables are, maybe reread the question, and just think about it. In this experiment with the remote, what is the independent and what is the dependent variable? So I'd like you to think about it, and if you're completely stuck and you're completely confused, don't worry about it. Just by trying to figure this out, uh, it's going to help this stick better in your brain hopefully help you get a better score on the test. So you could pause the video and try it now. Okay, so basically here, the dependent variable would be whether the, whether the remote turns the TV on, and the independent variable would be whether the old or new batteries are in the remote. Now, you might have worded your answer a little bit differently, and that's fine, but as long as you were thinking along these same lines, you can consider it correct. And I just really want you to understand here that in this example, 
Whether the remote turns the TV on depends on the batteries in the remote. If the old batteries are in the remote, the remote is not going to turn the TV on. And if you put the new batteries in, the remote turns the TV on. So remember, the independent variable, it's something that you think might be affecting the phenomenon. All right. So the independent variable here is the batteries that are in the remote. And whether or not the TV turns on depends on the batteries in the remote. Hopefully this makes sense. I know it's kind of a funny example here, but um, we want to keep things basic. It, and here's another example here, because this is, it can be tricky. So studying these examples here will hopefully help this make more sense and become more clear for you. So in this example here, we're talking about a person I made up named Zach. Now Zach, in this make-believe example, struggled with GED math, so he decided to do an experiment. Zach studied for two hours before his first try taking GED math, and Zach failed on his first try. Zach hypothesized that he needs more hours of studying to pass on his second try. Before his second try, Zach studied for 20 hours. Zach passed the test on his second try. Now here's a question for you to try. Which of the following is correct? A. The dependent variable was Zach's test score, and the independent variable was how long he studied. Or B, the dependent variable was how long Zach studied, and the independent variable was his test score. So I'd like you to pause the video, try to figure this out, just think about it, and just note here that whether you get this right or wrong, I really don't care. It's all about the learning and all about that knowledge. Just by trying and just by thinking about this and processing it, it's going to help stick this in your brain better, even if you don't get this right or are completely confused. All right, so I'll leave this here. You can pause it, try it. And hopefully you had a chance to try it if you'd like to. So let's go over the answer here. And so the correct answer here is A. The dependent variable was Zach's test score, and the independent variable was how long he studied. Another way to think about this is think about here, you know, what are we changing? What is the cause and what's the effect, right? So the effect would be the test score. So because he studied longer, he got a higher test score. The dependent variable was that test score. The test score depended on how long he studied. He studied less, he got a worse score. He studied more, he got a higher score. Again, the test score Zach got depended on how long he studied. So if you're still confused on this, note that you might get a question or two on independent and dependent variables at most. Um, so it is worth, it's worth taking some time to understand it, but I wouldn't stress out about it too much if you're having trouble with this. Just to understand the basic idea, you might get a question, two at most on this would be my guess. Um, and if you get that right, great, you know, if not, then um, that's okay too, it happens. So we're going to move on now. We're going to talk about how to read graphs. So a lot of the GED science test, it's going to be reading passages. It's going to be problem solving, critical thinking, um, using charts and data and graphs to answer questions. And so the little method I've uh, put together here is what I call reading the TLC, title, labels, and the challenge or the question. I'd really call it the TLQ, but I think TLC makes it easier to remember. Um, but basically, the title and the labels on a graph are going to give you the big picture, and the actual question that the test writers ask you is going to tell you which part of the graph to focus on. All right, when they give you graphs, usually not all of the information is going to be relevant, but you can scan the title and skip in the labels and that is going to help you see kind of what the information is all about, but the question will tell you what to zoom in on. All right, and a lot of people sometimes what they do is they, they don't read the title. When you're given a picture like with a graph on it, they'll just go too fast. They don't read the title. They don't look at the labels, and so I want you to get in the habit of doing that, um, and I think it's going to hopefully help your score. Um, another tip would be, like I just said, just put it in writing here. Try to ignore everything that's not relevant to answer the question because a lot of graph questions, again, like I said, not everything is going to be relevant for the question, and there's a lot of excess stuff. Um, now, this might be the most important general tip for getting graph questions right, and that's to follow the direction of the line. And some rules of thumb here, generally speaking, any line on a graph that's going up is showing an increase. Any line that's going down is showing decrease. And if you see a flat line, that generally means no change. So I'd like to look at a few examples of this now, and let's look at them now. Okay, so here's a question. What trend occurred in January through February? A, a decrease in snowfall, or B, an increase in snowfall? So I'd like you to pause your video, pause the video, and try your best to figure this out, and then we'll go over it. 
Okay, so let's go over this. So remember, what we want to focus here is using the TLC method. And whether or not you actually use this when you go into the test, that's up for you, up to you to decide. But I just want to give you kind of a strategy to use here. And remember, the T stands for the title. So let's look at the title of the graph here. The title says average snowfall in inches in Championsville last year. And this is a made up place. I just made it for the video. And now we want to look at the at the labels, the L, right? So we got the T out of the way. Let's look at the L. So it says here average monthly snowfall in inches. And we see this is going up from 0 through 12. Now the other label down here is months. And we see we've got months January through June. So we've looked at the T. We've looked at the L. And just glancing at the title and the labels shouldn't take that much time, hopefully. And we see this line here in the graph. We see all this information on the graph, but what do we need to focus on? What part of the graph should we focus on? Well, remember, the challenge or the question, all right, the question is going to tell us what part of the graph to look at in most cases. So it says, what trend occurred in January through February? So what do I need to look at on the graph? Well, I need to look at what's going on between January and February. Now you obviously, unfortunately, you can't draw lines like this on your screen on the test. All right, so I'm just doing this to help us learn here. But what we need to focus on for this question, we don't care about anything that's happening over here. We don't care about what the blue line's doing anywhere over here. We just wanna look at the part of the graph between these two black lines. And we see here that the blue line, it's going down. So we know that the answer here, the trend is a decrease in snowfall. Okay, here's another question. What trend occurred in February through March? Was there a decrease or an increase? And all the information is the same. So I'd like you to pause the video, try this out, and then I'll go over it. Okay, so remember here, and the strategy I'm giving you right here, whether you choose to use it or not, it's totally up to you, but it's the TLC method. So we look at the title and it's the same title, we look at the labels and they're the same. So we already have the T and the L because they're exactly the same as the last question. And this time, the challenge for us is what trend occurred in February through March. So remember, the title of the graph and the labels kind of give us the big picture. But the actual question is going to tell us what part of the graph to look at. Because not all the information on the graph is going to help us get this right. In this case, it's February through March. So I'm going to draw black lines here to help us here, and you'll kind of want to do this mentally on the test. And the key here is that we only want to focus on the blue line in between these two black lines. So I don't care about what's happening down here on the graph. Don't care about this part. I only care about what's happening between February and March. All right, so I've isolated the part of the graph I need to look at, and I need to ask myself now, is the line going up? And the line is going up. So that means that there was an increase. Now, let me tell you here, let me give you kind of the trick to all of this here that makes this all work is we have to have on our vertical axis here, the numbers have to be increasing going up, which they are. And in most cases, they will be increasing going up. But you'll want to check that if you get a graph question on the test. But whenever the numbers are increasing going up, when the line is going down anywhere on the chart, it always represents a decrease. So like over here, this whole thing is a decrease right up until we get to May. And it's kind of hard to see maybe uh, if you're watching this on a cell phone or, or even a computer. But there is a part of the blue line right here that I've traced in black. And this is a flat portion between May and June. Uh, the line is supposed to be flat. It's hard for me to trace it and make it look flat. But just imagine this, this very flat right here, which means there was no change. All right, and so again, if the numbers are increasing going up, which will almost always be the case on your test, you'll have to check it and confirm, but it should be the case. Any line that's going down shows a decrease. Any line going up shows an increase, and any line that is flat just means that there's no change occurring. Now, you might be wondering, is it gonna be this simple on the test? I would expect it might be a little bit harder than this. I wouldn't think it's gonna be much harder than this. The point is just to take away you know, the strategy here, we're practicing the basic fundamental skills to getting these kinds of questions right. And it's going to help you to master this strategy here because when you get harder questions, you can apply that same technique. And it's hopefully going to help you get them right. So now let's switch gears here and let's talk about how to beat ecosystem and food web type of questions. It's important to understand how to do this because on pretty much every practice test I've seen from the official GED testing service, there is some variation of these ecosystem type of questions. All right, so it's important to know how to do them. 
And what you see on the screen is a pond ecosystem here that I've kind of made up for the question. But fun fact here, the pictures on the screen are actually photos I took of fish that I actually caught here. Uh, fishing is one of my favorite hobbies. I try to go twice a week when I can, but I often don't get time to go that much. But basically, here's a photo of me on the left here holding a largemouth bass that I caught, which is my favorite fish to catch. And I'm just showing here on the right here how I kind of crop myself out of it. Uh, maybe you can see a little sliver of my hand up here on the right here. Um, and then I just took this uh, fish after I crapped myself out and I just kind of turned it on its side like you see here, right? Here's that same photo here, just turned on its side. And I really did the same with all these other fish here too. So just a fun fact, actually now that I, I notice it, this minnow here, I did a bad job cropping because if you look around the outline here, like you still see bits and pieces of my net that I didn't fully crop out as well as I did in the other fish. But um, fun fact, I actually caught these fish in the photos here, but um, let's focus on the question here now before I, I get off on a tangent because I really could talk about fishing for hours, but I know that's not what you're here for. Um, but the question says, a small pond ecosystem contains minnows, bluegills, catfish, and largemouth bass. Based on this oversimplified food web, what would most likely happen if minnows were removed from the pond? A, the bluegill population would decrease, or B, the bluegill population would increase. So, as always, I'd like you to pause the video, try to think this one through, and then we'll go over it. The idea here is that if, what you have to understand here is that the bluegills are higher up in the food web than the minnows, all right? So, the bluegills are gonna eat the minnows. Now, if you take minnows out of the pond, the bluegills are going to lose their food source. The bluegill population is going to decrease. So A is the correct answer. All right, so if that was tricky for you, don't worry. Um, you know, we're going to give you another shot at it now with a little bit different question here, but it's a similar concept here. So this question, it says, based on this oversimplified food web, what would most likely happen if catfish were added to the pond? A, the bass population would increase. B, the bass population would decrease, or C, the bluegill population would increase. So I'll let you pause the video, take your time with this, and then when you're ready, we'll go over it. Okay, so let's think about this here. So if we're putting catfish into the pond here, all right, what I want you to understand is the concept that we see the largemouth bass and the catfish are on the same level here in the food chain. So that means that they're going to compete with each other for food, all right? And so if the bass eat the bluegills, and we add catfish into the pond here, the catfish also eat the bluegills. The bass and the catfish are now gonna be competing for the bluegills. So what's gonna to happen to the bass population is the bass population is probably gonna decrease because the bass are gonna have, they're not gonna have as much food now because the catfish are also eating the bluegills. Not as much food means, unfortunately for the bass, the bass population uh, might take a hit. Some of them are gonna starve. Some of them won't get as much food. That's the circle of life. I know it's really sad, but hey, that's how it goes. And B is the correct answer here. The bass population would decrease. So hopefully this makes sense here. I would expect that if you get a question like this, it's gonna be very similar to what you see on the screen here. Instead of just A, B, and C, you're probably gonna have A, B, C, and D. And they might add like another, they might add another level or something here. Instead of just having two species at a certain level, they might give you three or something like that. But I wouldn't expect you to get something too much more complicated than this on the test. Okay, so let's switch gears and talk about chemical reactions, which is another important topic to understand. So what we see on screen here is a chemical equation, and we use chemical equations to represent chemical reactions. Now, the first point that I want you to understand is that the numbers that are in front are called the coefficients, and I've highlighted them in red. We see the three before the NaOH, and we also see the three before the H2O over here. So these are called coefficients. Now, what I want you to understand is that the coefficients are going to tell us how many NaOH and H3PO4 molecules are going to react, and how many Na3PO4 and H2O molecules are going to be produced. So we see here, basically we produce three H2O molecules and one Na3PO4 molecule. And if we don't see a coefficient in front, like we don't in front of the Na3PO4, and we don't see a coefficient in front of the H3PO4 over here, we just assume that it's one. All right, now the most important thing though to understand is that you can change these coefficients when you're balancing the equations. All right, so that's one of the most important points so far 
is just understand this bullet point here pretty clearly. You can change these coefficients while balancing. And like I said, if no coefficient is, is written, the coefficient, we just assume that it's one. So the other numbers that you might see on the screen are called subscripts. And the number after the chemical symbols, which I've shown here in blue, are called the subscripts. And subscripts tell us how many atoms of an element are in a molecule. So, for example, this H3PO4, this is a molecule here, right? And we see that the coefficient here is 1 because it's not written. So we would say that there's one molecule of H3PO4. And the 3 tells us that there are 3 H atoms and four O atoms in the molecule. All right, um, so that can be a little bit confusing to understand. So it's not super important that you wrap your head around that, but the most important thing to take away here is really that you don't change these subscripts while you're balancing. So you don't wanna mess with these little numbers down here. It's only the numbers in the front that you would alter while balancing. So those are probably the two most important takeaway points here before we look at an example of how to do this. But just remember, like I said, I'll repeat it again and again and again because it's, it's I really want it to sink in. The numbers out in front, like the threes here and the imaginary one that we don't write out, those are the numbers that you change while balancing. These little numbers down here, which we call the subscripts, you don't want to change those while balancing. It's going to give you the wrong answer. Okay, and also you should understand that Everything on the left-hand side of the arrow, we call all the substances over here the reactants. So if you notice that there's this arrow right here, just look at what's going on to the left of the arrow, right? Which I've highlighted these in blue. Everything to the left of the arrow, we call these substances the reactants. And everything to the right of the arrow, which I've shown in red, we call these the products, right? So the reactants are shown on the left side, on the right side of that arrow, we see the products. So that's another thing to remember here. And the arrow just means reacts to yield. So the arrow is kind of like, kind of like an equal sign in math. It's not exactly the same thing, but it's a similar idea here. Basically what's going on here is if I wanted to read this all out, I would say there's three molecules of NaOH and they're reacting with one molecule of H3PO4 to yield one molecule of Na3PO4, and three molecules of H2O. And the word yield, it just basically means that we're producing, right? So the, these two substances react to produce these two substances over here. So just basically, again, just to keep it simple, everything on the left-hand side, remember that those are called reactants. Everything to the right of the arrow, we call those substances the products. Okay. So now we want to, here's an example here. I want you to determine if the chemical equation is balanced or not. So I'd like you to pause the video, try to figure this out. And if you're just completely lost and you have no idea what to do, don't worry about it at all. Like I've said, all you have to do is just, just try it out. Just think about it. And that's going to help you remember it. And then I'll show you how to do it. Okay. Hopefully you had a chance to try this. So basically when we're balancing, what we want to do is we just want to look at everything on the left-hand side and we want to count up all of, we wanna count up what we have here. So let's identify which atoms we see. So if I just look left to right here, just to the left of the arrow, I see we've got a C, we've got H, we've got O, we've got another H, we've got O's. So I'm just gonna write C, H, and O. So the first step, if I was gonna figure this out, I would just identify which atoms we've got, C, H, and O, and now we're gonna count them. So if we just go left to right here, we see that there's a two in front of the C, so we would say that there's two carbon atoms. Now what about the H's here? Well, here's the trick. So what we have to do is we have to say, hey, well, there's a little uh, subscript here that's a three, so we have three H's, except we have a two out in front. So everything we multiply by two here, so it's really gonna be two times three, so we have six H's. Now we have this other H over here, and we have to multiply that by two as well. So it's gonna be another two H's. So let me write this out for you, hopefully make a little more sense here. So remember, initially we've got three hydrogen atoms and we multiply by two because the coefficient is two, that gets us six, but we also have to uh, add this other H right here, which really should be two hydrogens over here. 
right? Because it's not just this one hydrogen, it's times two. All right, so the H is on the left-hand side of the equation, and total we have eight. Again, we've got two times three, all right? And then we've got to also do two times the one H, all right? And we add those up, that gets us eight. So hopefully that makes sense. Now let's think about our oxygens over here. All right, so we've got two oxygens. We see O and a little two, but we see a three out front, so we've got to multiply that by three, which gives us six oxygens. So we have the two oxygens, and then we've got to, oh, then we also have the oxygens over here, right? So we have the two out front, so we take that two times oxygen here, and then we have the six oxygens over here. So we have to add that together, and that's going to give us eight oxygens. So hopefully that makes sense. If not, you can rewind that, watch that again. I'm explaining this kind of slow. I know it's tedious, but it's important to just understand how to do this here. So let's look at the right-hand side. So again, we've got C's, we've got O's, we've got H's. So I'm going to write out C, H, and O. Now let's just go left to right and see what we've got here. So for the carbons over here, I see we've got two carbons, right? Because we've got a two out front here. We've got one carbon, two times one is two. Now what about the hydrogens? What about the H's? Well, we see that we've got, we've got H with a little two here. We see a four out front. So we just do four times two, which is going to be eight. All right, so again, we've got those two carbons, and then we've got, if we go to the oxygens now, we also, we're gonna do a similar process. So that, let's look at the first molecule here, right? We've got two CO2. So let's do two times these two oxygens would be four, but now we also have this oxygen over here, so it's four times one here, which would be four. So we have four oxygens, and then we have to add another four oxygens, which would be eight. All right, and we have those eight hydrogens. So we put this all together here, and so I've totaled everything up here. We see we've got two carbons on the left, two on the right. We've got eight hydrogens on the left, eight hydrogens on the right. And we've got eight O's on the left, eight O's on the right. So this is balanced up. So basically when you're checking if something's balanced, all you have to do is just, you wanna just add everything up here. Just like I said, just remember, you gotta look at the subscripts. You have to look at the coefficients. And just remember that you just um, just take stock of everything you have here. If everything matches up, you're balanced out. And I have a video where I, I show all kinds of examples of this, and we look at uh, examples here where you have to balance an equation yourself here. Um, but if you understand this, you, you should be in good shape here. These are just kind of a little bit tedious until you get the hang of it, but hopefully aren't that tricky for you once you've seen a couple examples. So hopefully this helps give you a good start at least on how to manage these questions. So the next topic that I want to talk about is photosynthesis, which photosynthesis here is another important topic that um, a lot of people say comes up on their tests. So since we just talked about chemical reactions, I think it's fitting to start with the equation for photosynthesis. So what this equation is, it's uh, 6CO2 plus 6H2O react in the presence of light to give us sugar and oxygen, right? So we've got carbon dioxide, reacts with water in the presence of light to give us sugar and oxygen, all right? And so, as always, everything on the left-hand side of the equation, these substances are what we call the reactants. And you guessed it, the, everything on the right-hand side of the arrow, all the substances over here we would call the products. So carbon dioxide and water are the reactants, and sugar and oxygen are the products. Now, just note here that you might, instead of sugar, they might show you carbohydrate or they might give you the word glucose. Those are used interchangeably. So, for example, here, I have this labeled as C6H12O6. I've labeled this as sugar. They might also, instead of writing sugar, they might put the word glucose here or they might even just write carbohydrate here. I'm not sure how they'll do it on your test. It's kind of just luck of the draw, but uh, just know that you might see those words used interchangeably. And so now that we've started with the equation, let me give you the, the concept here. So basically all that's happening here is there's carbon dioxide in the air, all right? And car there's carbon dioxide in the air, if we think of a plant, and there's water that's in the soil, and we've got some sunlight in the mixture here. So carbon dioxide from the air and water from the soil are gonna react, and it's gonna make oxygen and glucose. And here it's labeled as just carbohydrate. 
Now, I have a really silly way to remember this, and for those visual learners, this might help you remember it. If not, it just might make you even more confused. Um, but basically, the way that I, I teach people to remember this is picture a car that's on a very icy road, all right? And it's so icy that the driver just has to pull over in the middle of nowhere, all right? Now, ice is just frozen water, obviously. And the car is on ice. The car can't go unless we get sunlight to melt the ice. So think of carbon dioxide, right? And think of the word car. So car kind of sounds like carbon dioxide, right? So think of the car to help you remember carbon dioxide. Picture it on ice to help you think water. And then remember that we need sunlight so that the, it'll melt the ice and the car can go. Go, G-O, glucose and oxygen. So remember here, picture that car, and that helps you remember carbon dioxide. You picture that car on the ice, helps you remember water, and just remember that you need sun to help the car go. And go, G-O, stands for glucose and oxygen. So again, we have carbon dioxide react, and water react in the presence of sunlight to give us glucose and oxygen. So you know, if you have to remember that, if you had to remember that equation from scratch, which you shouldn't have to on your test, but um, if you had to remember everything from scratch for some reason, you would just have to think of that car, picture it on the ice, and the car gives you carbon dioxide, the ice helps you think of water. Remember the sun has to be involved, so we've got water and carbon dioxide reacting in the presence of the sunlight, and then the car can go. G-O, glucose and oxygen are the products. So hopefully that helps you kind of uh, just think about what's going on here with photosynthesis, because I know that Sometimes when you get an equation like this, it's kind of hard to understand what is happening. So what I'm trying to do here, I'm trying to show you the equation here. For some, some people, uh, they can kind of remember and understand it by the equation. I'm also trying to help you understand it by giving you this kind of diagram here that shows what's really happening with photosynthesis here, where we've got you know water in the soil, carbon dioxide's in the air, and in the presence of sunlight, we're gonna get glucose and oxygen. And then for people who really like to remember things visually, tried to make it as silly as possible here. Here's my little car diagram. All right, the next question says, the data in the table below represents the highest daily temperature in Championsville measured over a four day period. And Championsville is a place I made up for the example here. Now we see day one, two, three, and four. We see the temperature on each day in degrees Fahrenheit. And I've given you this formula right here to use. And you will be provided this on your science test. Uh, you won't have to memorize this formula. And the question says, what was the temperature on day one measured in degrees Celsius? You may use a calculator. So let's have you pause the video here. There are no multiple choice answers for this question. We'll just have you try to come up with the answer on your own here. And I don't really care how you round it. Um, I just want to see how you do and then we'll go over it. Okay, so let's go over this. So there's a shorter way to do this, but it's, it requires a little memorization and so I don't want to overload you. So first, let me show you how to do it with the formula here. So basically, we just take the value from day one, which is 90, and we're gonna substitute it into the formula in place of this temperature Fahrenheit. All right, so temperature Celsius. So what I'm gonna do is rewrite this now with 90 in place of temperature Fahrenheit. So I have, let me keep my parenthesis here, and I have 90 minus 32 times 5 over 9. Okay, so what am I going to do first here? Am I going to try to multiply? Am I going to try to divide? Um, or am I going to do what's in the parentheses first? Well, I'm going to start with it what's in the parentheses first here. So I'm going to do 90 minus 32. So in my calculator, 90 minus 32 is 58. So already right off the bat, I'm just gonna rewrite this whole thing here. So I have 58, and where did that 58 come from? Again, it's because I did 90 minus 32. So 90 minus 32 is 58. So I have 58 times five over nine. Okay, so my next step here, I'm going to do 58, and I'm gonna multiply that by five. And that's going to let me show again with this arrow that I'm rewriting it. 58 times 5 is 290 divided by 9. So in my calculator, 290 divided by 9 gives me, and I'm going to write the answer right here, gives me 32. 
point two 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 two. So let me just say, I'll just say 32.22. So again, I, I was I don't really care. This isn't the math section, so I'm not super picky about how you rounded it. But as long as you got this 32.22, maybe you rounded it, you did 32.20, whatever. As long as you got uh, something really close to this, then you did the answer. You did it the right way. Now let me show you the faster way to do it, though. Too. So here are the tricks, and I wrote here: remembering these two tricks can save you time for temperature conversions. To convert from degrees Celsius to degrees Fahrenheit, multiply the degrees Celsius by 1.8, then add 32. And to convert from degrees Fahrenheit to Celsius, subtract 32 from degrees Fahrenheit, then divide by 1.8. And I have two thens in here because I made a typo, so let me take that out. Um, but anyways, so for temperature conversion questions, they will provide the formula so you don't have to memorize these two things. You just have to use the formula like I showed you how to do. But if you want to, you can memorize these two bullet points here, and then it is a lot faster to do the conversion. So what I'd like you to try now is I deleted the formula here just so you can practice using the quick tricks here. Um, what was the temperature on day two in degrees Celsius? So I'd like you to take this temperature on day two, try to convert it to, uh, take the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit, try to convert it into degrees Celsius. But you have to use the information in these two bullet points now without the formula. Like I said, on the test you will have that formula, but I'm just doing this to get you some practice using these two tricks here. All right, so let's have you pause the video. Try that out. You can use a calculator. I don't really care how you round it, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so if we want to use the trick here, so we're starting in degrees Fahrenheit, so we're going to use the second bullet point here. So to convert F to C, we are going to start with the, we're going to subtract 32 from the degrees Fahrenheit. So all I do is I'm going to do 87 minus 32, and so if I put that in my calculator, it is 87 minus 32, I get 55, and so then I'm just gonna divide by 1.8. So I have 55, so let me divide that by 1.8, and in my calculator right now, I get about 30.5555 five, 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 and a bunch of fives, and so I'm just gonna round at 30.56. I don't care how you round, you know, um, I just wanted you to get something that is really close to this. I don't really care about the rounding right now because I just want you to get the basic idea down. But uh, I just hope you see here that this is just an alternative way to do these questions, but it does require you to memorize these two tricks. So it's up to you to decide if you've got a lot of other stuff to cram in your head for the test, memorizing these two tricks it might not be worth your time because they'll give you the formula on the test and you'll be able to use that formula but just note that i do think if you can memorize these two bullet points i do think that it can literally take you maybe 10 to 30 seconds to shove the numbers in your calculator get the answer um, using these two bullet points but it's really not that much longer if you use the formula up to you to decide i just wanted to prevent you to, to present you with the two ways of doing this and just again, I know I repeat myself a lot in these videos, but I know people skip around sometimes, which is understandable. And so some people might not hear me say it earlier in the video. And repetition is just always really good to help you learn. But just understand that if you want to use the these two tricks to convert, you'll have to have these memorized. But again, they will give you the formula. So if you don't memorize these, you can still get these questions right. You just have to know how to use those formulas. Okay, the next question. The data in the table below represents the highest daily temperature in make-believe Championsville each day measured over a four-day period. Day one is 90, day two 87, day three 90, day four 86 degrees Fahrenheit. But the question this time, it doesn't have to do with temperature conversions. It has to do with what is the mean median, mode, and range for the temperatures above. Now, I'm not gonna give you multiple choice answers for this. I'd like you to try to figure all of these out, the mean, median, mode, and range. Try your best to do it. I don't care how you round again. It's not the math test here. I just want you to just try your best. I don't care how you round it. Just run it however you want to, and our answers should still come out pretty close. And so let me uh, turn this over to you. I'll pause the video. Let's just give you a shot at this. And if you get stuck, as always, don't worry, because we're just going to go over it. Okay, so let's start now by learning how to calculate the mean. So the mean just means the average. That's all it is. The mean is the average. So I'm going to write right out up here uh, how we would do it. So to find the mean, you just take all of the numbers in the data set, and you add them up. 
and you're going to count up the total number of numbers in the data set and then divide by that number. And you might be thinking, wow, what are you talking about? Okay, there's somebody outside, like uh, they're doing like weed whacking or something, so I do apologize if that's on the video. Um, but anyway, uh, if it sounds like I'm uh, not making any sense here when I say divide by the total number of numbers, let me show you what I mean. So again, the first step to find the mean, take all the numbers, you want to add them up, and then you also need to count up how many numbers we have here. We've got one, two, three, four, and then you put that number down here and you're going to divide. So let me start everything up top here. Let me add these numbers up first. All right, so I'm using my calculator right now. 90 plus 87 plus 90 plus 87 plus 90 plus 86. And that gives me 353. And I divide by 4. And so let me do that now in my calculator as well. Divided by 4, I get 88.25. So again, if you rounded that to 88.3 or something like that, I don't really care as long as you got a number that is very close to 88.25. But what I mainly, more so than whether or not you get the right answer, I'm mainly concerned with do you know how to get the mean? Because on the test, you might be asked to do a question like this, but you're not obviously not going to get these same numbers. It's not going to be the same question. It'll be different numbers. So I'm mainly concerned with the process. Did you know to add all of these numbers in the data set up, count up how many numbers we have here? It's four and divide by that. If you knew how to find mean, I'm concerned with the process. So if you, as long as you understand the process here, you know, I don't really care about the answer that much for right now. Obviously on the test, you need to get that answer right so that you can uh, obviously you get more points on the test, but I'm mainly concerned with the process. So let's move on to the median now. In the median, which a lot of people often remember, the median is the middle number, but you have to first put them in order from uh, least to greatest. And that's one thing where I think a lot of people struggle with is they, they remember from maybe high school or just from hearing it before that the median, well, that's the middle number. And if you remembered that, then you were on the right track for sure but you have to put them in order from smallest to greatest first. And that's one of the most common mistakes I see with uh, people trying to calculate the median is they just they just look at the numbers here and they try to find the middle number, but it doesn't work that way unless you put them in order from smallest to greatest. And there's another little, uh, there's another little thing that you need to know about median questions too. All right, when there's an even number of numbers in your data set, you have to do one extra step. So again, to find the median, Always, always, always put the numbers in order from smallest to greatest first. And putting them in order from smallest to greatest, it should look just like this. And since we have an even number of numbers here, we have to do one more step. So we have to add up the two numbers in the middle and divide them by two. All right, so what I have to do is I have to, again, I'm going to take the two numbers in the middle, which are 87 and 90. And I have to divide these by 2. All right, so 87 plus 90 in my calculator, I get 177. Dividing that by 2, I get 88.5. So my median is 88.5. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. So again, the median, what you do is you take all the numbers in the data set, put them in order from smallest to largest, and look for the middle number. Now, in this case, there's not a clear middle number because we have an even number of numbers that we're working with here. So in that case, you need to take the two numbers in the center, add them up, divide by two, and that's how you find the median. Now, if, for example, I'm just making this up here, all right, if I had something like this, if I had, let's say I added another number here to the data set, and we had five numbers. If I had five numbers instead of four, but in other words, if I had an odd number of numbers, then the middle number would just be 90 right here, right? You would just say, you would just kind of say one, two, one, two, and you see how there is actually a, a number in the middle here. Okay, when there's an odd number of numbers, you just simply have to find that middle number after you've ordered from smallest to largest. Okay, when there's an even number, again, what do you do? When there's an even number, what do you do? An even number of numbers, you look for the two numbers in the middle, Get rid of that 91. You find the two numbers in the middle, add them up, and divide it by two. Okay, so that takes care of our median. Now, the mode is just the most occurring number. 
And here we see that we've got two 90s in our data set. All the other numbers, 87 and 86, they only appear one time each. So the mode is simply going to be 90. So for the mode, find the number that appears uh, the most. All right, so we've got 90. That shows up twice. That is simply the mode. And the range really should be the easiest. So you just take the, the biggest number, which is 90, and you take the smallest number, which is 86, and you're going to just subtract them. And 90 minus 86 is just simply 4. So that would be your range. And these questions are super, super important to understand because you might get these on science. You might get these on math. If you get a question like this on math, it's the exact same process here. You might even get this on social studies. People have reported to me that they've get mean, 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 mode, and range questions on social studies. So this is really, really, really important to know, not just for science, but note that you're probably going to get on when you do your... When you take the test, when you're testing on all four sections, at some point you're going to get a question like this. I can almost guarantee it. You're going to get mean, median, mode, and range somewhere on your test. So it's really important to, to take the time to know how to do this. Okay, the next question says, the data in the table below represents the highest daily temperature on Champion Beach. And I wish we were on the beach right now, relaxing. You probably do too. It'd be nice to take a beach trip. So we're going to call this one Champion Beach. And each day for a four day period, I've given you the temperatures with the exception of day four, which is missing. So we know that the mean temperature is 93.25 degrees Fahrenheit. But what was that temperature on day four? Now, this is a hard question. This is the hardest mean, median, mode, and range type of question that you would find on the test. But this is fair game for your test. These kinds of scenarios do come up on the test. So try this one out. And if you get stuck, don't worry. This is one of the hardest questions on this video. So try your best, and then I'll fill you in on how to do it. So all we're doing here is we're going to take the mean, which is 93.25. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to set this equal to... The sum of all the values in the data set divided by 4. Why is it divided by 4? Because there are 4 numbers in our data set here. Okay, so all I'm going to do, take the mean, set it equal to the sum of all of the numbers in the data set divided by 4. All right, but the, the catch here is that we don't know what the value on day 4 is, so I'm just going to replace that with an x. All right, so that's all we're going to do here. And hopefully you're following along right now. Hopefully this is making sense. I know a lot of people get headaches over this for some reason when I explain this exact thing. A lot of people have questions about this, but I'm just going to show you how to do it as simple as I know how. It is kind of complicated, but if you just stick with me, it's not all that bad. All right. So again, let me just keep, I'm going to keep repeating myself over and over again here because I really wanted to sink in how to do this so that you remember for the test. All right. All I did was I took the mean temperature here, 93.25. I set it equal to the sum of all the numbers in the data set divided by 4. And we did 98 plus 88 plus 94. We don't know what day 4 is, so I put an x here. All right, so all we're trying to do is to solve it for x. Now, what I want to do next here is I'm going to add up everything that we can in the parentheses here. So I'm going to just rewrite this whole thing. We have 93. 0.25. We're going to add up all of the numbers here. 98 plus 88 plus 94. And we can't do anything with the x because we don't know what the x is. But if you add 98, 88, and 94, you'll have 280. Oops, that's supposed to be an 8. 280 plus x. And it's still divided by 4. Okay, so again, what we're trying to do is we want to get the x by itself. All right, if we figure out, if we get x by itself on one side of the equation, that tells us what x is. x just represents the temperature on day four, which will give us the answer to the question. So I have 93.25 is equal to 280 plus x divided by four. How do I get the x by itself? Okay, so what I want to do is I want to get rid of this four down here. Now, the way that I do that, it's 280 plus x divided by 4. So I'm going to have to multiply by 4. All right, the opposite of division is multiplication. So I want to multiply by 4. Whatever you do to one side, you also have to do it to the other. So I have to multiply by 4 on this side as well. This is going to cancel our 4s out here. All right, and this little dot here is just representing multiplication. So let me do my calculator. 4 
times 93.25, which would be 373. So I have 373. 373 is equal to 280 plus x. So hopefully this is getting a lot simpler than what we had initially. 280 plus x. And again, the name of the game here is to get this x by itself on one side of the equation. We're almost there. It's 280 plus x. How can I get rid of this 280? Well, since it's 280 plus x, I want to do the opposite operation of addition, which is subtraction. So 280 minus 280 is zero, so this will cancel out. But remember, whatever I do to one side, I also have to do it to the other side. All right, so I wanna subtract 280, right? So 373 minus 280 gives me 93. So I will now have 93 equals X. And that's the answer here. So day four, the temperature is just simply 93. Okay, so the next question, we're now switching gears to genetics and Punnett square type questions. And it says here, brown eye color is a dominant trait, whereas blue eye color is a recessive trait. A combination of two dominant alleles results in offspring with brown eyes. A combination of a dominant allele and a recessive allele also results in offspring with brown eyes. However, a combination of two recessive alleles results in offspring with blue eyes. Now it says one parent's alleles are seen on the left-hand side of the square right here, and the other parent's alleles are seen on the top of the square. The genotypes of the offspring are missing though from the boxes below, the boxes being right here. It says please fill in the missing allele combination. So the first skill that we wanna work on here is just understanding how to fill out a box like this. So let's have you pause the video, and obviously you can't write on the screen unless you've got maybe some kind of tablet, I don't know, but um, just think, how would you fill in these boxes? And then we'll go over it. Okay, so to do a cross like this, basically, what I wanna do is the first box here, I take the B from the left-hand side and I combine it with the B that's up right here. So it would be big B, big B. So next, what I wanna do for this box over here, so I take this B, plug it in right here. And then I take the little b that's up here and I simply drop it right down here in the box. All right, so let's fill out this box right here. So I take my b from the left-hand side, put it right here. Now I look up here at the b that's on top and I drop that right down in here. Now for my box right here, what I wanna do is I want to, again, take my b from my left-hand side, put it here. Then I wanna look up top here, see that there's a little b, and I'm gonna put it down right here. All right, so hopefully you understood that this is how you would fill out a box like this. If not, hopefully you understand now. So that was the first part of this question. Okay, so here we go now with a new question. And I've written the question right here. What percent of the offspring will have brown eyes? And also, what percent will have blue eyes? So I'd like you to pause the video, Try to figure this out, and if you get stuck, don't worry, we'll go over it. Okay, so to make sense of this, we've got to understand kind of the information here from this first blurb. So what you need to know is that there are two alleles here that are combining. So, so we have the one parent has a big B and another big B. They've got two big B alleles. Then another parent up here has a big B and a little B allele. Now. We have to think here, um, whenever you write a dominant allele, you always use a capital letter, all right? So the allele combination, big B, big B, that's two dominant alleles. It tells us here the combination of two dominant alleles is gonna result in offspring with brown eyes. All right, so two big Bs is gonna give us brown eyes. All right, now, what about a combination of a dominant allele and a recessive allele. So again, a dominant allele, we always write that as a big B. The recessive allele, we're gonna write as a little b. All right, and so this is also a big B and a little b is also going to give us brown. Now, lastly, the information tells us 
A combination of two recessive alleles results in offspring with blue eyes. So the recessive allele, again, is going to be a lowercase. So if there's two recessive alleles inherited, that will give blue eyes. All right, so let's keep this in mind here. And as we go to the question, what percent of the offspring will have brown eyes? So first of all, you have to understand here that this chart here shows four possible combinations. So we've got one, two, three, four. Now, in each case, we've got big B, big B, that would be brown, big B, big B, that's brown, big B, little B is also brown, big B, little B is also brown. So in each of the four cases, the offspring will have brown eyes. So actually, for uh, the first question here, it's going to be 100% will have brown eyes. And in each combination, we see it's either going to be two big alleles, meaning two dominant alleles, or a dominant and a recessive allele. But we know that a dominant and a recessive allele is still going to be brown. Um, and we don't see any cases where we would have uh, a big two little Bs or two recessive alleles. So we know that the percent that will have blue eyes is going to be zero. Okay, so I'm switching it up a little bit here, but this all the text is exactly the same as the last question. The only difference now is that I've switched up the parents' genotypes, right? So we still have one parent's alleles shown on the left-hand side, one parent's alleles shown on the top here. Um, and so it's the same exact information. It's still the brown eye and blue eye color. But I want you to now work with this different, um, this chart here. I want you to fill out the missing allele combinations into this chart for practice. So let's have you pause the video, think about how you would do this, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so this is a good practice, just get some repetition in. So we're gonna take one B from the left-hand side, put it in right here, that's that big B. And then I'm gonna look up top here and I see a little B, so I'm gonna drop that little B in right here. All right, so now I look on the left-hand side here, I see a little B, so I'm gonna put that right here. Now I look directly up on top of the box, I see that's a little B, so I put another little B right here. All right, so for this box here, again, I go over to the left-hand side, I take the big B that's there, fill it in here, then I go up and I take the little B that's up there, drop it in here. Now for this box down here, again, I go all the way over to the left-hand side and I see that I've got a little B over there, so I put the little B down here. Now I take this little B and fill that in here as well. So hopefully you knew this as the first step. Okay, so. Now the question is, what percent of the offspring will have brown eyes, and what percent will have blue eyes? So I'd like you to pause the video, try to figure this out, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so recall again here that uh, if we have a big B and a little B, that is going to be brown, but note that two little Bs is going to be blue. So big B, little B is brown, and two little Bs is going to be blue. All right, and also keep in mind here that big B, big B would also be uh, brown eyes, but we don't see that in our Punnett square. So if I look down here at the Punnett square, we see that we've got four different cases again. One, two, three, four. Okay. Now, how many cases have brown eyes? Well, we see one case here, big B, little B, and another case here, big B, little B. So two out of four cases, the offspring will have brown eyes. Two out of four is just equal to half, right? Two out of four, that fraction reduces to half, which half is equal to 50%. So 50% will have brown eyes. Now what about blue eyes? Well, it's really the same thing. If we look at the cases that are gonna have blue eyes, we see it's gonna be a little b, a little b, a little b, a little b. That represents two out of the four cases. Two out of four again is half, 50%. All right, so in, so 50% of the offspring, we would predict to have brown eyes, 50% will have blue eyes based off of our Punnett square here. 